The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Okay. Welcome back to the Retro Rangers Podcast. I'm your host, George Grimm. And I'm here tonight with authors Matthew DiBiaz and Sean McCaffrey. And we are going to uh, talk about the best and worst uh, uh, general managers in New York Rangers history. Okay, welcome to the, the uh, podcast, gentlemen. Well, great to be here, George. Sean, yeah. The same here. Okay, Matthew is the author of, of a number of books about football and hockey, including The Art of the Dealers, in which he ranks uh, many famous NHL general managers. And Sean is the author of a massive uh, four-volume set called Tricks of the Trades, which... Uh, which uh, uh, um, which chronicles every trade made by the Rangers in their 97-year history, and it's it's um, an interesting book to go through. Some are good, some are bad. Okay, so the Rangers have had uh, 13 general managers, if you count Con Smythe. There's Lester Patrick, Frank Boucher, uh, Muzz Patrick, Emil Francis, John Ferguson, Fred Shiro, Craig Patrick, uh, Phil Esposito, Neil Smith, Glenn Sather, Jeff Gordon, and Chris Drury. Uh, some of these guys were good, some were bad, and some were downright ugly. So, Matt, what's your top three? Well, uh, when I, I went through my rating forms, and what I did was I took all 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 twelve. Not, I'm not counting Con Smythe. All twelve Rangers uh, GMs, and I I isolated those years where they were general managing the Rangers, and uh, it did the calculation just strictly based on their Rangers records, so like uh, those GMs who served with other teams like uh, Glenn Saylor and Emil Francis. I didn't count their years with like the Edmonton Oilers or the St. Louis Blues or like Phil Esposito, his work with Tampa Bay. So based solely on their work with the Rangers and only with the Rangers, my top three are as follows. Number one, Lester Patrick, by a very wide margin, uh, a value of plus 70, because, Sean, I don't know if you ever read my second book. I use a plus-minus system for my calculations, and his was a plus-70. Uh, number two, Neil Smith at a plus-43. And then third, and, George, I don't think you're going to like this, uh, considering your feelings about him. I got Glenn Sather at the third spot at a plus-36. And, George, I know you love the, uh, the cat. I got the cat at number four at plus-24. Uh, and all of that. So, I mean, with Lester Patrick, the irony is he didn't really build those first Rangers teams. It was Con Smythe who built that roster. But, you know, he left and moved on to Toronto, and it was Lester Patrick that took over. He was simultaneous head coach at GM. He, he just he, he ran it. He didn't build it. He just simply ran the bloody team. <laughs> and, yeah, and what a great team it was. I mean, he had... You know, he had a great line of Frank Boucher, Bill and Bun Cook. He had Ching Johnson. I mean, these are Hall of Famers. And uh, and during those early years, you know, uh, when the you know from you know from the what I call the expansion and contraction era, from twenty six to forty two. I mean, the Rangers were able to win three Stanley Cups. You know, they were always contenders. Uh, and they, they, you know, they were one of the strong teams there, along with the Boston Bruins and the Detroit Red Wings and the Canadians. Uh, they, they were always, you know, one of the key teams, you know, in the Stanley Cup playoffs during that 16-year time period. Now, for Neil Smith, Smith, I had the pleasure of interviewing him for my for my second book there. And he was, he was a great interview, and basically. Mm-hmm. He took over after Esposito, and the team was basically in the doldrums. And what he did was he just he, he revitalized. He basically revitalized the team. He he got first he got Roger Nielsen, you know, as head coach, and then you know he got the big trade with Mark Messier and all. He got Messier, who really was taking the team up to an even greater level. Level. I mean, he also had you know Brian Leach, who Craig Patrick brought on the team. Uh, you know, you know, he basically had in place Brian Leach, Mike Richter, and Tony Amante. 
And uh, what Smith did was he brought in more prospects. He got in Sergei uh, Nimchinov, Sergei Zhubov, and Doug Waite. Alex Kovalev came in 91. And you know, then he got Messier, who, who was supposed to you know, take this team all the way to the top. And the thing was, under Roger Nielsen, it wasn't happening. I mean, and it just wasn't working. And finally, Neil Smith decided to go for the gusto, and he brought in Mike Keenan. And sure, Mike Keenan, you know, Iron Mike took the uh, Rangers to the 94 Stanley Cup, you know, Stanley Cup and all that, but also... It, it was it's like that old Jules Pfeiffer cartoon with Bobby Kennedy. You got the good Bobby and then got the bad uh, Bobby. In this case, yeah, Neil Smith got the good Mike Keenan, but he also got the bad Mike Keenan, who was all and never stopped his Machiavellian plotting. I mean, when I interviewed Neil Smith, oh man, he went on and on about the shenanigans Keenan was doing, the double dealing, all the Machiavellian stuff, the double deals with the Red Wings and. And, and the St. Louis Blues. I mean, it would just eh, it just made you want to shake your head. And and then finally, you got Glenn Sather. Uh, I mean, I know George. I mean, for years, you and I. You, you, I know you never liked Slats. I know you never did. But somehow, he did it. I mean, uh, it took him a long time to do it. I mean, he, he, when he was with the Edmonton, he he wasn't drafting anybody good for like a, a 17 or 18 year period. But when he got to the Rangers, he he got Le- Henrik Lundqvist. Uh, he got Ryan Callahan. No, 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 no. He. I was, waiting, oh, I, was waiting, I was waiting for somebody to jump in on that. <laughs> Go ahead, John. He didn't get Lundqvist. It was the uh, it was uh, Baloney. Neil Smith. Uh, 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 it was uh, Maloney and uh, Martin Madden who were left over from uh, Neil Smith's um, uh, era because uh, the uh, draft was only a week or so after Sather was hired and he didn't have time to uh, assemble his staff. So, yeah, he came in under under uh, under the um, uh, you know Glenn Sather's umbrella, but let's not give Glenn Sather any more credit than we have to. <laughs> Okay, but he do he still got Brian <laughs> Callahan. He, oh, just what, yeah, what's Just yes. answer, he was a seventh round pick. It's not like he was on anybody's draft board either. You know, it's not like Sada had him in his, you know, targets. You know, right? Yeah, but you know, he also Slats got in Ryan Callahan. He got Brandon Dubinsky, Mark Stahl. He also got Chris Kreider, Derek Derek Stepan, Jesper Fast, J.T. Miller. Uh, the only thing was his trades with the Rangers were very spotty. I mean. Uh, it was like a mixed bag. I mean, he got he got a good one getting uh, Brian Boyle and Ryan McDonough in 2009, Rick Nash in 12, Broussard in 2013, Martin Saint Louis, you know, in 2014. But it's still the problem is it took time. I mean, George, you know it. You got Sean, you know it. It took a long time, you know. And then finally, yeah, you know, they didn't reach the finals until 2014. And of course, they got you know they got beaten by the L.A. Kings and all that. I mean, that was literally his last hurrah as it were. And also, he never could find the quality coach, you know, to really take it all the way. I mean, uh, he, he got Alan Vigneault uh, and all that, but that was that was basically it. And he didn't, you know, A.B. didn't really last that long. So, again, it was a mixed bag with Glenn Sather, in my view. But those are my top three. So, George, Sean, you know, weigh in. All right, Sean, you want to go? I, well, I pretty much echo a lot of what Matt said, aside from the obviously Sather there. But uh, what I did like that you brought up was uh, the Con Smythe stuff because, yeah, you're right. Without Con Smythe, uh, it helps Lester Patrick's numbers big time. He built the team. So I think Smythe has to be like an asterisk there with uh, Patrick. But, yeah, I have Patrick number one, too. I also have Neil Smith as uh, my number two. And there's no way I could have Glenn say there's three because I think what we should also say is, you know, all these GMs worked on a different parameters, whether it's a salary cap, you know, no salary cap, limited roster, you know, just all the different stuff that went on in each era. So it's kind of hard to just, you know, say one or the other, you know, when you try to rank them. But when you look at Glenn Sather's era, he got lucky with the owner. He had a guy who does not care about the team. James right. Dolan always only cared about the Knicks first. The Rangers is always – when he got the Rangers, it was like buying a pack of 25-cent gum when you check out the supermarket. It was never <laughs> – you know, it's not like he was uh, ever focused on it, where these other owners that the Rangers had, even though it became corporate in later years, you know, they they cared. That's why you saw shorter tenures. Glenn Sather pretty much got to run the team without, you know, he never had to worry about getting fired or anything like that, you know. And mm-hmm. even now he's still an employee of the team. So it's not, yeah. and he's, to this day, he's still the longest tenured GM of New York City sports history to never win a championship. 
So I don't know how I can't have him up there as number three. And I'm probably going to go with George as number three, unless George has him ranked higher than me. I got I got to go with Emil Francis, obviously, you know. Yeah. Well, I have uh, I have Les DiPatrio as number one, and I have Frank Boucher as number two. Now, he didn't win a cup as a GM. He won a cup as a coach his first year. But he had to go in and clean up uh, Lester Patrick's mess after World War II. Because Patrick, yeah. Patrick uh, mis- miscalculated World War II. He thought the league was going to shut down. So he, he basically uh, just basically uh, stripped the, the Ranger Farm system of all their players, and he... Um, he didn't really leave that many players, uh, you know, other than the uh, New York Rovers, to uh, fall back on when when some of the uh, Rangers got called to act, uh, active duty, and uh, and uh, you know Frank Boucher had to uh, rebuild the team. He had to, he had to uh, travel across Canada and uh, resign uh, all these working uh, agreements with teams, and he he ended up getting the team into the um, the finals in 1950, where they they lost in 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 the double overtime to uh, Detroit, and, and you know that was that was pretty good and after after all George, the see a, George, see a, they went through. George, just to your just to your point there, the 1950 they didn't even have a home game either because of the circus. That's right. Yeah, and that's the right. Double yeah. overtime, and if it, you know, I think it was Don Riley hit the uh, crossbar in Game Seven. Like I said, everything was on the road. One one pump yeah. shot the other way. Theory, yeah. you know. Yeah. The reason why I had the cat at the number four spot is his first two seasons as GM, 65 and 66, Rangers you know, did very poorly, failed to make the playoffs, and they had a last place finish in 1966. And basically, I, his value as a GM, I have as a negative 19, you know, based on what the team did on the ice there those first two seasons. So basically, the cat had to dig himself out of a hole. And I think what hurt him, if the Rangers had won the 72 Stanley Cup, that would have helped him out, you know, enormously. That would have helped him get in that third spot. And also the fact that there was like a three- or four-year period, George, they were in the conference finals, but they just couldn't get the win to get him into the finals. And that cost Emil Francis a lot of chance at building up, adding you know, points to, uh, to uh, you know, you know if you can get into the finals, right. you get you know extra points and all that, and winning the cup and all that. I think that hurt him too. That's why I got him in the fourth seed instead of the third seed. Yeah. Well, you know I, I have, think- uh, I have okay. Emil and uh, Craig Patrick as uh, honorable mentions because I thought you know, Patrick was on the right track, but the uh, but he had Espo in the uh, in the broadcasting booth uh, uh, critiquing his every move and and um, ownership listened to Espo and they got rid of uh, Patrick. And as far as Amel is concerned, I I always thought he was he was a little too loyal to some of his players. I mean, uh, there's a lot of those a lot of those uh, playoff series, uh, especially against Chicago, where I thought Gilles Villeneuve would have been a better choice in goal because he he always played better against Chicago than Andy Jockerman. But Amel always uh, uh, um, went with Eddie because as as um, Bill Chadwick and King Clancy used to say in the intermissions on those old Channel 9 games, you got to dance with the girl, what brought you? And, uh, and I think that's what Emil, Emil thought. He, he, you know, um, you know, he was in the playoffs because of Eddie, and he was going to gonna go with Eddie. And uh, although, like I said, I think, I think Gilles would have played better against Chicago, and he did lose uh, twice to Chicago. They they lost that, that that one year after 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 uh, Pete Semkowski's overtime goal. You thought they'd be all pumped up, and they lost the uh, next game in uh, Chicago. So, you know. Sean, I'd like to ask you a question about Craig Patrick. Because uh, when I interviewed George McPhee, he played with the Rangers during the Craig Patrick era, and the one thing he gave Craig Patrick high marks on is that he basically built. Uh, a 21st century team in the 1980s. He said those 1980 Smurfs would have been one heck of a team in the 2010s if they if they had played 30 years later than in the 1980s. I mean, Sean, based on your own research, do you concur with that view? Oh, yeah, definitely. And then he also uh, brought a lot of the international flavor in, too, you know. And that's because he worked in the Olympics, you know. So I think, yeah, yeah I think right. that's a fair assessment. I just want to go back to Francis for one second. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that's not going to show up at the grading system, and another thing we're not talking about here, 
is that Francis also kind of ushered in the first rebuild they ever had. Before right, he right. Was very, you know, trading off all the, all, you know, the girls who brought him to the dance. And three years later, they're in the Stanley Cup without him. You know, so I think that's just that up there either, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thing about Craig Patrick is. Oh, 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 sorry, I just forgot. And the other thing I was going to say, when you look, when we talk about the two worst GMs, look who's in the look, look who's in the middle of that sandwich. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, uh, so I think that I just think Francis, uh, a lot of the stuff you're just looking at like black and white stuff. I think a lot of the stuff he did is not being like brought up here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and you know, I, you know, I, I, uh, I uh, became friends with Emil during the time I was interviewing him with for the book. And uh, he, he's a fantastic man, and I just, I, I wanted to include him in top three, but I couldn't. So that's why I gave him uh, honorable mention. But uh, yeah. the cat will always be, uh, you know, close to my heart. I'll tell you that. Because that yeah. those are the Rangers that I grew up watching. So you know, they, yeah. they were my guys. I think. But here's the thing. Uh, one problem is that Amo Francis never could find a coach equal to his great coaching skill there. I mean, he never could find it. He is, so he had to do double duty. And sadly, he was like the very first heartbreak coach in NHL history uh, when, I, when I was doing my very first book there. And that lack of playoff luck always, that was the cross that he had to bear. And it's sad in a way because, you know, Amo Francis was such a great, you know, uh, such a great architect of teams and all that. I mean, the Rangers were, you know, in the abyss, and he took them out of the abyss, and he made them viable again. And, I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why he earned his Hockey Hall of Fame induction, in my view. I mean, I had the honor, and George and I both had the honor of meeting him, and the, the greatness of the man is just self-evident. His genius, uh, just everything was there. And it's just a yeah. shame that he wasn't able to add that Stanley yeah. Cup, you know, to the Rangers and all that. Yeah, yeah when you talk to some of those old Rangers, they all say, you know, to a man, they regret not having won the won the cup for the cat, but uh, you know, Amel Amel didn't want to let go. I mean, when he was coaching GM, he he had the opportunity to bring in Freddie Shiro, although Freddie Shiro did have a drinking problem. But um, you know, and he he brought in he brought in people who were uh, not not right for the job, like uh, Boom Boom Jeffrey on. He, I yeah. think I think. Uh, Boom Boom was in over his head, and he ended up getting an ulcer. Larry Popeen, uh, the players just didn't like him. He was he was too much of a hard ass. He was he was um, used to coaching younger players who were afraid of losing their job, and these guys were not, you know. Just, and then Ron Stewart um, didn't get didn't really get a chance because he he was let go as soon as John Ferguson came in. So, if you look yeah. at the Francis era, up to him, every coach was a former Ranger. Yes. Yep. Yep. So yep. That, that's part of the errors where you talk about like Fred Sher. Oh, I guess Sher was a former Ranger too. But you yeah. know, we're looking at um, you know, that's just the, he was with the players that you knew. You know, that's just the way it was back then until uh, mm. Ferguson took over. Yeah. yeah. You know, thinking of looking over at what Craig Patrick brought to the Rangers. I mean, he had very good drafts. I mean, John Van Beesbrook and James Patrick in 1981. Kelly Miller, Tony Granato, and Thomas Sandstrom in 82. Dave Gagne in 83. Terry Karkner and Shel Samuelson in 84. Mike Richter in 85. And Brian Leach in 86. I mean, fantastic drafts. But just the problem was, I mean, the, the Rangers' ownership was absolutely impatient. You know, and if they had just right. had to the, let it, let these kids grow into these uniforms, you know, give it yeah. time. And uh, that's the tragedy. That's the great tragedy because when Neil Smith took over, they demanded it. We want it now. Now. Yeah. Well, the, other, the other problem yeah. with Patrick is when he was at his heyday, the Islanders are winning all the time too, so that didn't help matters. You know? Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. When I had uh, um, uh, Craig Patrick on the podcast a while ago, he said that he learned how to be a general manager with the Rangers. And then yeah. he went to Pittsburgh and he, he, won, uh, he won some cups. So, that's um, right. yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That, that's our loss, his game. So, all right, Sean, bottom three, you're up. <laughs> I gotta go, Glenn, say the number one. <laughs> I gotta go. Oh, I'm not sitting down. The worst ones, I got Sather as one, I got Ferguson as two, and I got Muzz Patrick, but kind of by default, as three. 
Okay, we concur on two. You, Sean, you and I concur on two of the three. Uh, George, you, you you do your worst, and I'll come in with mine. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I um I would put Espo in there because um, he he made some bad trades, and uh, uh, he he you know when he when he traded Ridley and Miller to Washington for Bobby Carpenter, and then he turned around and he traded Carpenter to the L.A. for. Um, Marcel Dion, when I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago, I tried to open up the interview by asking him, oh, you know, what was your best trade? And he said, George, they all sucked. So, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so <laughs> can't answer like that why I can't have him in my top three because he's always so honest and blunt, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he, he went on to drop a lot of F-bombs and, you know, so... <laughs> He was a lot of fun to interview, but um, he, he also said that Marcel Dion came to him and said he wanted out of L.A. and he wanted to come to New York, and that was behind the, that part of the trade anyway because Marcel was tired of losing in L.A., but I think Marcel was in, was in the wrong place in the, in the Patrick division back then. He was, just, he was old and he was small, and he, it, it just wasn't, wasn't the place where he should be, but... Um, and you know, I I took John Ferguson uh, because of the Middleton trade and because of the way he handled uh, firing Rod Gilbert, and uh, he did change the uniforms, which which was a bad move, and he let John G. Talbot coach behind the bench with a with a running suit on, so <laughs> things you know things that you don't do. Um, I had heard that uh, Boston originally wanted uh, one of the Vickers instead of uh, Rick Milton, but Vickers had won the call the cup a couple of seasons before that, so so uh, Fergie didn't want to lose uh, Vickers. And you know, at that point in time, Middleton wasn't proven. He he was he was a young guy who hasn't hadn't really done anything yet. So I don't think Fergie thought he was losing anything. So. And he also had a lot of input from Espo on that deal. Espo really wanted uh, Hodge to come along. If you look at the uh, uh, look at Sam's between them, Francis and Shero, they both went to a Stanley Cup, like right, you know. And right. then Francis and Don, and what? I don't think he lasted two years. Maybe a year and a half, I think he lasted. Uh, uh, roughly three seasons, uh, par- uh, two whole seasons and a portion of a third, if I recall Fred Shero uh, and on all that. Um, now for me, uh, I'm going to start in reverse order. Uh, third from last, Fergie, minus 22 value. Three consecutive last place finishes. Uh, just, you know, just he, he took something. He basically took the team that uh, Emil Francis bet and he tore it all asunder. Just absolutely tore it asunder. Uh, second from last, Muzz Patrick at a minus 29 I mean, this is Muzz, you know, during the dark years, you know, after Frank Boucher from the late 50s to the early 60s. I mean, basically the Rangers and the Bruins were taking turns finishing in last place. Uh, just, it just, it just, it, the darkness of it all. Just the team couldn't do anything. Perpetually lost in the doldrums five times in ten years. They don't make the playoffs. I mean, they, I mean, he started off with three straight playoff appearances, but they keep getting knocked off. No Stanley Cup Finals appearances, and he was, you know, he was a second worst. And finally. The worst of them all. Uh, don't take this wrong, George. I got Boucher. I mean, I know he was trying. He took a team. He inherited a corpse. Try. He was creating a farm system and all that. But sadly, during the regular season performance, and I'm going, you know, strictly on the season performance. I mean, just he was a minus 48. Uh, two last place finishes. I mean, uh, I mean, even with the stand, even with the Stanley Cup appearance, you know, in '50. Right. Just, right. It was accumulation of things. I mean, he had two seasons, you know, a, a minus eleven. You know, two minus eleven seasons. That's minus two. That's twenty-two of, out of four minus forty-eight points right there. I mean, it was just it was sad in a sense. You know. Also, don't forget, Lester Patrick in the beginning was undermining him. He was yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was undermining him. I mean, Boucher talks about it in his memoirs. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted to. He wanted to trade. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Frank Boucher wanted to trade for uh, uh, Buddy O'Connor, which ended up being the, the best trade Boucher ever made. And yeah. 
and uh, Lester didn't like it. Lester didn't like giving up uh, a couple of younger guys for a guy who wasn't really that old, but he was a good player. And um, and uh, Boucher, you know, actually put his his uh, job on the line. He said, "If you don't let me make this deal, I'm going to quit." And uh, I guess it was John Reed Kilpatrick finally uh, let him um, let him um, make yeah. the deal. The way yeah. George is a Francis guy is the way I'm a Boucher guy. So uh, when I hear Matt's numbers, I don't know the story just because you got to also remember, Boucher took over Patrick, you know, like George said, you know, they got rid of everyone before World War II. But when World War II ended, he had to bring back all these old guys because of the, uh, well, I can't remember the exact name of the law they had. But everyone, everyone was guaranteed a job when they came back from the war. That's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah. So he was stuck with these guys who hasn't played in three, four years, and by then they were all done. So those early years, he, like, he had to build, he had to build from the ground up all over. And like George yeah. said, in 50, they're back in the cup, mostly because of Chuck Rayner and, like you said, uh, Buddy O'Connor and Frankie Edo's there too. Yeah. I, you know, he just had a tough, you know, bad era, but he did stay too long, and he, he admitted that in this book too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, Sean, my rating system deals with actual performance in regular season. There's no real theoretical aspects of it. I deal with actually what actually really happened, as it were, okay? It's not like right. other people use Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorems or anything like or expected wins or anything like that. I deal with what actually re- what happened right there on the ice. And yeah, that's why, you know, you got to take the rough with the smooth. I mean, Boucher had his bad moments, and it's sad in a way. I mean, a great man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just think you got to also – I understand your numbers. I'm just saying you also got to understand the circumstances, too. And, I, yeah. you know, I didn't have the – like I said, you didn't get to the Stanley Cup there. Not many of them did, <laughs> you know. Oh, I know. Goodness me. Yeah, absolutely. And they should have won that one in 50, like I said. Like, every game right. was on the – and that was an era where home ice really meant something, you know? Right, yeah. 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 Uh, that, that uh, 1950 final, when I was writing the, the book uh, about the uh, about the Boucher era, there were at least three or four Rangers who hit the post in that overtime, and they almost won it, but um, they didn't. So. Yeah. I think Stan yeah. brings up those posts to me at least once a week when we go back and forth on email. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, as far as Glenn Sather, all right, let me let me get Glenn Sather off my chest. I'm I I'm get, actually I working get, my uh, way through uh, through Sean's third volume of his uh, three volume set, which it's this this volume is four hundred something pages. It's all about Glenn Sather's deals, and so many of them are just a waste of time. It's just depressing. He he threw big big money at people. Who he later had to buy out, and um, and he would he would make trades that just didn't go anywhere, didn't do anything, and find, and and he hired Brian Trottier because he had good handwriting, and he hired Ron Lowe, who he who had, he had previously fired in in Edmonton, and finally he brought in Tom Tom Rennie and uh, and and uh, Tortorella and Vino. And he, you know, he got serious about the coaching aspect of it, but uh, just, just a waste, waste of time. Just, and like Sean said, if he didn't, if he wasn't good friends with, um, with uh, Jim Dolan, he would have been fired years ago. But the one thing that's good about Sather is that he kept Jim, uh, the, the owner, Jim Dolan, away from the Rangers because Dolan uh, trusted. Say this, so he didn't he didn't butt in, like he butted in recent, uh, a couple of years ago when he fired uh, 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 Jeff Gordon. But um, um, I just it, it, when you talk about uh, Glenn Sather, I just shake my head. I mean, I don't even think he would have done it as well in Edmonton if he didn't have uh, Wayne Gretzky dropped in his lap. So, uh, so I'm not a fan. So gotta break it in. Go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. So you got to bring up the quote too. What, what did he say uh, in Edmonton when he's talking about the Rangers? Oh yeah, that he would um, uh, win every year if he had the Rangers payroll. I well, yes, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. Even uh, you know, before the cap came in, he 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 didn't make the playoffs. So yeah. I just I have no. Uh, 
I have no respect for the guy. So. I think what happened in uh, me and George from a Ranger fan perspective. I think Matt has a more overview perspective, but yes, as Ranger, yes. no way you could have say you know. <laughs> I just, I'm just not a fan. <laughs> Yeah. Sean, when you were doing your research for your book, did you get to talk to Slats at all? Or no, did he brush you off like he brushed me off? Because I tried to get through to him. <laughs> Don't laugh. Here's a story, Sean. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I Somehow I managed to get Slats' home phone number off the Internet. Don't ask me how. I mean, I didn't do anything illegal, but somehow I found it. I actually called. I actually spoke to Mrs. Sather, who handed the phone to Slats, and boy, did Slats blow, me, blow my ears out. I mean, <laughs> he... he I mean, he flipped. He told me that I wasn't following protocols. You know, I wasn't going through the Rangers front office. Yeah, I tried the Rangers front office. You can't get anywhere, man. You talk about Byzantine. You know, yeah. I couldn't get to, I couldn't even get to home plate with that. And and Slats, I mean, he insulted me. I mean, he just. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, thank you very much. Now I know. Now I know why. Now I know why George hates his guts and all that. <laughs> but Sean, did you ever try to get through to Slats? Did you do it or no? I didn't even try because I know what I know what the answer is going to be, you know. Yeah. Outside yeah. Larry Brooks, I don't think anybody gets to get a hold of him, you know. When it comes yeah. to like a report, writer, or anybody, you know, he just yeah. can't get his. Email. Well, actually, I I uh, emailed him last week. I got his email address from someone, and um, he actually responded. He didn't respond. One of the PR people responded, and he said, yeah. uh, "We're going to have to uh, decline," which I kind of expected. I was I was happy that he. Um, responded at all, but I didn't really expect him to uh, actually, um, you know, agree to an interview. So, it's, it, you know, life goes on, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so listen, um, we got anything else to talk about as far as the, uh, the best and the worst? No, we don't want to talk about the Patrick Kane, the possibility of Patrick Kane coming to the Rangers. You, you have so many men, right? Uh, I've been all in on this since July 2022. I've been talking about this on my website. I've been all in. I thought they should have done it then. I think they should do it now, and I'm excited that's going to happen. I'll tell you what, looking at Kane's stats right now, I mean, he's still like the second biggest scorer, scorer on the Blackhawks. And the thing is, despite his age, I mean, he's still up there. And the thing is, right now the Rangers, they were hot once, but now they've got a three-game losing streak. I think, I think also Kane wants out. I mean, the, the Blackhawks have been a corpse for like six out of the last seven years. I think Patrick Kane wants out. He's got – Rangers are up and coming. You know, I, I, I could see it as him bringing a championship, championship experience to the locker room there, some character – you know, some offensive punch and all that. I'm not I'm not against it. Um, it depends. I mean, if Patrick Kane still got something – I mean, Sean, do you get a sense he still has something left to prove? He sees the opportunity with the Rangers. He can get in, you know, maybe take help the Rangers like Messier did, take them as deep in the playoffs. I mean, how do you see that, Sean? I don't think it'll be Messier because it's a whole different situation, you know, because he's obviously the captain, came in as a leader. And uh, yeah. Kane's only going to be here as a rental, you know, no matter what happens, you know. But – uh Kane definitely wants to be here. You heard what he said when they got Tarasenko. He was disappointed that it wasn't him. And what happened since? He's getting hat tricks, you know, three point games every night. And he's doing it against top teams. What do you get? Two goals and uh, two assists against Dallas the other night. He had that hat trick. Yeah. He gets against. So ever since he got burned when they got Tarasenko, he's been a man possessed. So I, I think he's all in. Wants the Rangers. I think he wants to be a Panarin. Because you remember the first year they played together, he won the uh, Panarin won the Calder, and he yeah. hard. So I think he's all in. I, I think it's what you said, too. Chicago's been a corpse. Yeah. And uh, I think if he didn't win a cup, you know, I think he'd be like – I think the trade would already happen by now. The fact that he has three is, like, he's not going to affect his legacy no matter what he does from here on in, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it makes him a million percent better. It make, it's just it's the perfect fit because then it balances out the Rangers fourth line. You put – you really want to go in the playoffs with Jimmy Feasy as your first line forward. Nothing against him because he's playing well, but – you get Kane up there, I mean, and then you get Terrence. I mean, it makes him a threat everywhere, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the Rangers don't get him, where do you think Kane goes to? I mean, what do you think? What's your theory? I saw Colorado. Oh, yeah, because, hey, because Colorado's struggling at that eighth seed, man. I mean, from wor- from wor- first to wor- you know, uh, down to eighth, man. I mean, they need, they need an injection. They need some type of a pump, man, somehow, somewhere, some way. And the other team, I would think, uh, I thought 
going like in the summer, I thought it'd be the Rangers of Colorado. Now, like if I had to play a third team, I would say Vegas, just because they're in the thick of things and uh, they just put Mark Stone on LITR, so they could afford him without having to use, need a three uh, third team to make the trade happen. Now that's <laughs> intriguing. There, I mean Vegas, yeah, I mean the top seed there. That would be Peck Kane would be that insurance policy, that that little extra ingredient that can really. You know, push you. You know, push you to the top. You know, as we're getting down to nut cutting time, yeah. And I just want to throw this theory out for you. I know this is not going to happen. I know Jonathan Taze is from COVID or something. But I think imagine if this pitch got Kane and Taze. They, they get Taze. They put him on LITR right away, and then like Kusher off two years ago. Then you activate him for the playoffs. Can you imagine? It's like I said, it's not going to happen. But can you imagine that? <laughs> hey, yeah. Sean. Can I ask you a question about the Flyers? Because my, I, I, the Flyers, basically they've gone to hell, and I'm, yeah, I don't even blame it with Torres. My theory to the Flyers is that what they need is what the Detroit Red Wings did when they hired Jimmy Devolano in 1982. They need some a GM, a total outsider, to give the entire franchise a custard enema. I mean, do you concur with that, Sean? I mean, they've been going with cronies you know, favored by Clark and Holmgren all these years. And even the GM is a, fly, is a Holmgren crony. And I think they need to do like the Red Wings did 40 years ago, get a complete total outsider and just totally rip and gut the whole team apart, treat it as if it's an expansion franchise, and start all over again. I mean, do you get that same feeling if you had to do an independent analysis of the Flyers, Sean? Yeah, I would kind of agree with you. And you can even say what Detroit did now, you know, with Steve Eisenman. He came in right fresh eyes, you know. I know he was there a long time ago, but I'm saying as an executive, you know. He yeah. tore him all down. I think right now they have the second wild card right now. Yeah, they're the eighth seed at the present time, but it's, it's they're in a dead heat with the Panthers, so they're fighting tooth and nail. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. But I think with the Flyers, yeah, they, they just – the, the team is hopeless. I mean, I don't even blame it with Torts. I think he, he's inherited a corpse in my so, view. I mean, yeah. They had a lot of injuries, too, this year. But it's funny, because going into the season, I thought they'd be halfway decent. But I, I, like you said, it's time. Maybe like you, like, you're right. Maybe just do what the Wings did in 82, get, you know, gut, gut it and get some new eyes and fresh uh, faces in there, you know? Yeah, they're, they're, they're trading too much on nostalgia. I, and I, I was never confident with Torts. Nothing against Torts, but I just did not see his – I didn't see his style really fitting in well. I – uh, no, I didn't think anything was going to happen. Actually, uh, the, play, the Flyers are meeting my, expect, my expectations. I thought, no, that's the way they're going to end up, man. Torts or no torts, they were just just going to be a corpse. That's all. I thought Carter Hart would have a great season on the torts, so and that didn't really happen either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think part of it is that the whole culture is just sapping his confidence. He, what he needs is a real coach in a real atmosphere where he can get that confidence. I mean, since goaltending is basically the mental game anyway, I, I think he's just he's in a bad situation. What he needs to be is, is in a right situation with right coaching and a right front office where he could really shine. It wouldn't surprise me if he ever got traded. Wherever he gets traded to, that's when he's really going to kick it into gear and really you know, take off as a goaltender. Wouldn't surprise me one bit. That's what happens, yeah. Um, what about uh, the fact that maybe Torts isn't the kind of coach to uh, coach a young team? Maybe maybe he's the kind of guy you br- you bring in like Mike Keenan uh, when you're ready to make that next step. Maybe uh, he doesn't have the patience to uh, work with a uh, young team on the way up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Trump. Yeah. I was just say there wasn't that many kind of jobs out there this off season. You know, for an experienced team, it's mostly younger teams looking for new coaches, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would prefer Barry Trotz, you know, and all that. But the thing is, with that front office, I wouldn't be doing Barry Trotz any favors at all. I mean, if they had a brand spanking new, you know, managerial team and then you bring in Trotz, then I would feel good about it because Trotz would be so perfect working with youngsters, you know, developing them and nurturing them like he did with Nashville, like he did with the Islanders, you know, and later with the Caps. You know, I, I just um, – but right now, with this present managerial team with Fletcher and them, I, no, I wouldn't touch it. I would stay away. I, if I were a coaching thing, I said, uh-uh, I would not touch it under the present management, in my view. I would walk away. I think that's why they got Torts, because no one else wanted to touch that team, in my view. And Torts was desperate enough for the job. Yeah, I'm 
be Trot's point, would he really want, at his age, would he really want to go with a young club? Don't you think he'd rather, like, towards go to a contender if he could? I don't know. I don't know. Just, But they need, I think what the Flyers need is to embrace the code of the new. they got to find some good, young, stud assistant GM who's looking for the right opportunity, you know, whoever it is, the bright, because that's what Jimmy D was in 82, the best assistant GM out there you know, and look, needing the right place to go to. And he, he found it with Detroit and went on to glory and all that. And you, that's what you need. And, you know, a, a, a real good, bright assistant GM, it's, you know, itching to make some moves, ready, not afraid to make, you know, take some chances and all that and get some kids and get some good young coaching talent as well. They need their, they need their own version of Chris Jury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, don't laugh. Drury's not doing bad. I mean, he got off to a good start. He's a plus seven, according to my calculations. Uh, very good start. I, I'm keeping my eyes on him. Yeah, I am. Good. Wow, good. Only a plus seven with the conference final the first year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm keeping my eyes on this guy. You know, you got a very decent start. Very good, yeah. Just to go to your rankings, what was the highest uh, range of ranking you had? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, on my list, I'm, wait a minute, checking here. Wait a minute. Oh, shoot. Uh, I mean, based uh, just Rangers alone, like I said, uh, Lester Patrick at plus 70, Neil Smith at plus 43, Slats Lester at Patrick. plus 30. Ooh, yeah? Lester Patrick, you said, was plus 70, right? Yes. Uh, I, based on his performance, Slats at plus 36, Emil at plus 24, Chris Drury at plus 7, Fred Schur at plus 6, Craig Patrick at plus six, Espo at plus three, Jeff Gorton at plus one, then Fergie at minus 22, Muzz at minus 29, and Boucher at minus 48. Okay, that's based on what, how they pre- their teams perform as general managers. So just, okay. to to Pat- just to go to Patrick, you have as a plus 70, right? Yes. And that covers 20 years and three Stanley Cups. Right, right. It would have been even higher, but those last four years from 42 to 45, I mean – it was hell. I mean, the team, the right. team literally went into the abyss. I mean, it would have been higher, you know. World War II, but, yeah. So, I'm just saying, so you have him at 70. You have Chris Jury at 7 already after one season. So, Jury hangs around for nine more years. You'd be the highest guy on your list. Could be. Could be. Yeah, could be. You know, we'll have to see how it happens, man. I wish him, I wish him luck. I mean, right now, Rangers, hopefully they, they get a shot and make the right moves, man. I'd like to see what happens here. Yeah, we can only no, hope. Yeah, we can only hope. Yeah, I'm excited for what happens to the playoffs. It's going to be a tough first round because you know they're going to draw the Devils. And the Devils might be in, all in on Timo Meyer too, so that's another thing to watch out for. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Sean, may I ask you a question? Uh, are, you got a book out, right? And I'm looking for guests on my own personal podcast. I have some empty slots later this year in the fall, like uh, November and December. Would you like to appear on my show, Sean? I'd love to interview you where you can talk about your, your latest work or, or all your books. How many books have you have out, Sean? I have nine books, but uh, two of them are four volume sets, and another one's a solo book. Okay, you got anything out coming out this year or no? I'm working on uh, one right now. It's called the uh, Top Hundred Most Hated Villains of Rangers History. Ooh. So it's gonna be more. My other books are kind of serious. This one's gonna be more comedic, you know. Ooh. Okay. And then I'm hoping to write the, about the uh, Rangers 2023 Stanley Cup victory. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah. I mean, Sean, uh, I think I got your email address, man. Let's set up a let's set up a meet, man. I'd like to have you on my show. I mean, I I take it doesn't even you don't even have to have recent product, man. Just talk about your career, man. You know, just talk about your books, man. I'd love to have you on. Okay. Yeah, one thousand percent. Yeah, the George is set up after the show, I guess. Yeah. Beautiful, man. Yeah, I'll bo- I'll book you. I'll find a slot and book you in. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. I appreciate it. Oh, it's an honor, I'll man. Thank that, you. Um. Um. All right, we have to we have to wrap this up. But I want to ask uh, ask uh, Matt uh, uh, if he's working on anything now. Uh, right now, I'm working on my, my fourth book. Came out last September, Lords of the Gridiron Two: Pro Football's Greatest Coaches. It's up on Amazon. Uh, it's only available at Amazon. You can't buy it in stores. You have to buy it online. I am presently working on Patriarchs of the Dugout: Baseball's Greatest Managers. Hopefully, uh, if, uh, through the grace of God, the world don't blow up. Uh, it will come out April 2026. Oh, good, good luck. You. Good Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. You, every right. And I'm, yeah. I'm working on a book about Ranger General Managers, all, all, all uh, 13 of them. And 
I've been able to interview Craig Patrick, Phyllis Zito, Neil Smith, and um, that's it. So, so. When will that come out, George? Oh, who knows? Um, actually, I have a I have a book uh, that's with um, the publisher now called called The Forgotten uh, Blue Shirts about the Frank Boucher era, and they've had that for a while. So I'm waiting for that to be published. So uh, that's going to come out first, and then uh, probably around the time that comes out, I'll be finished with this one, and then we'll go from there. So I'm let not- me know when it comes out, George. I want you on, okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. No, Matt, you read every four, all four sports. What's that? You write about all four sports? Uh, well, yeah, my first two were on NHL hockey. My first book was The Bench Bosses, the NHL's Coaching Elite. That's up on Amazon. Second one was The Art of the Dealers, the NHL's Greatest General Managers. That's up on Amazon. My third was Lords of the Gridiron College Football's Greatest Coaches. That came out three uh, uh, three and a half years ago. That's up on Amazon, too. I got four in the uh, four in the hopper. I want to say, I think I have the art of your second book. I think I have it somewhere in my, I have about 50 books that yeah. I have in the stack that I haven't gotten through yet. I think there's one I actually bought on Amazon that's sitting in the stack that I'm going to have to push the top now. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that was my second book there. I mean, who'd have thunk it? Yeah, don't laugh. I mean, I thought five people in the world would buy that book, but guess what? It still sells today. People still buy yeah. the thing. <laughs> yep, yep, it's amazing. I saw a uh, recent resurgence in my first book, which I think is just because the Rangers are doing well. Yeah. yeah. I think that helped. You know? Like, I, oh, sorry, I saw my first book out selling the new one I had out. You know, the new one came out in September, so I sold a lot of those. But the first one's out selling the old but the other problem is I released four at once, which I probably should just stagger the releases. Yeah. But uh, like I said, this one started. I guess I think it's just because uh, the Rangers are doing well right now. That just got a big pickup, you know. Yeah. Money's money. Never argue with money, my friend. That's right. Yeah. Amazon cuts. That's all. <laughs> Me, my last three books I self-published using KDP and all of that. That's what I. That's what I did because I think it was. I had a publisher interested, but it wasn't worth. It's, it's more financially profitable to go do it myself than go with the, uh, someone else, you know? Right, right, right. I, you got control. You control your pricing, your timing. You got total power, my friend. Yeah. And like, what, the only thing the publisher could do is put you in a store. And how many people go to bookstores these days anyway, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. I, I, I love it. I love the control of it, man. You control the content. Everything is yours, man. The only price money I had to spend for is cover design because I don't know how to do it and all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I, my biggest cost was uh, the editor. So, I, you know, I don't want yep. to come off. So that's yeah. a pocket pocket. Yeah, you need, you need an editor. Um, yeah. the, uh, the books that I wrote, the, the Amo Francis book, we did everything, but Win is still selling well. Uh, Guardians of the Gold is selling pretty well, and uh, the book I did with Ralph Tycho, um, comes with his own in a Vada Pine Tar about baseball of all yeah. things. That's that's yeah. uh, selling very well too. So uh, it's been good. It's been a it's been a it, it's been a very uh, unique journey, and uh, I hope it continues. I think yeah. we did everything. Uh, favorite books of all. Time. Yeah. So. That's All okay. right, guys. I would I would uh, like to thank you both for coming on. We got to wrap this up. Um, you're both welcome to come on again. We'll talk about something else uh, anytime you want. You, you, the uh, podcast door is open. Um, I thank everyone for listening, and uh, have a good week. You too. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.